Hi everyone, it's Professor Pemberton. In this video, we're going to talk about average rate of change of a function. As we've seen in previous videos, functions are often used to model changing quantities between two different variables. In this section, we're going to learn how to find the rate at which the values of a function change as the input variable changes. So in this video, we're going to compare the rates of change at two points using average rates of change near the points, and also to describe how the two quantities vary together at different points and over different intervals of the function. So average rate of change. One example about average rate of change is something that you're very familiar with. Let's say we take a car trip and we record the distance that we travel every few minutes. The distance will be represented as the lowercase letter s. It's going to represent the amount of distance traveled as the function. And the travel time will be lowercase t. That will be the input variable. So s of t, the function will calculate the total distance traveled at the time t. One such graph that we can actually calculate the distance of our trip is actually shown below. The graph shows that we have traveled a total of 50 miles after one hour, 75 miles after two hours, 140 miles after three hours, and so on. So I've labeled those points on the graph. 1 comma 50, 2 comma 75, 3 comma 140, and we also have 4 comma 200 on the graph. Notice that the horizontal axis is representing time in hours that we have actually driven the car, and the vertical axis is represented as lowercase s, which is in miles, the total distance traveled at the time t. We can actually find what's called the average speed between any two points on the trip when we actually calculate the distance that we actually have driven by taking the distance that we actually have traveled and dividing by the time elapsed. So average speed is the distance traveled divided by the time elapsed between two different measurements that we actually have taken during the trip. So let's say we take the trip beginning at 12 p.m. What's the average speed between 1 p.m. and 4 p.m. using the graph of the function given? So notice that the trip starts at 12 p.m., so there are no hours passed since we actually started the trip, so t equals zero hours. That means at 1 p.m., that would be one hour has passed, so that would be s of one. That's the distance traveled after one hour of traveling after 12 p.m., or that would be 50 miles using the graph. And then s of four would represent the distance traveled after four hours of driving, which would be 4 p.m., and that would be, the distance would be 200 miles using the graph. So how do you calculate average speed? Well, average speed is the distance traveled. Well, we've traveled from 200 miles was the calculated distance at four hours after the trip started. And we have calculated 50 miles after one hour since the trip started. So we have traveled 150 miles during the three hour period of time. And so that means we have driven 50 miles per hour on average during that time period. We can also find the average speed over different time intervals. We didn't actually have to start at 1 p.m. and end at 4 p.m. always. Let's say we want to find the average speed between 2 p.m. and 3 p.m. So what's our average speed between those two different times? So S of 2 would be the distance traveled after two hours since the trip started, which would be 2 p.m. Well, notice from the graph that we have two hours. We've driven actually 75 miles, so that's S of 2. S of 3 is the distance traveled after three hours since the trip started which would be from the graph when t equals 3, the output value is 140. So that would be 140 miles for s of 3. So now we can calculate the average speed since we know both output values and both input values. We know the distance traveled and we also know the time elapsed. So the average speed would be the distance between the two different measurements. We had 140 miles after 3 hours. We also had 75 miles after 2 hours. So that would be a difference of 65 miles during that time period. And we also had a time elapsed of 3 hours subtract two hours between our two different measurements. And so 65 divided by one, or 65 miles per hour during the time period between 2 p.m. and 3 p.m. for our car trip. So notice between these two different measurements, we actually calculated the average speed between one and 4 p.m. Our average speed was 50 miles per hour, but over a different time period, our average speed was different. Between 2 p.m. and 3 p.m., our speed was actually faster. So you may have noticed from our last two calculations that finding average rates of change is actually very important in many contexts. We want to find out what is the average rate of change of a function because not always going to be talking about the average speed of a car trip. So we're going to be given a function. We're going to find out what is the average rate of change of the function over an interval rather than only being concerned with the rate of change in the context of average speed. So the definition of average rate of change. The average rate of change, or sometimes abbreviated ARC, of a function y equals f of x between x equals a and x equals b is defined this way. Average rate of change is the change in the y values or the change in the output values divided by the change in the x or the change in the input values over a time interval 
So notice that you're starting at, at x equals a and ending at x equals b to calculate the average rate of change. That would be the change in the x, or the b minus a would be the denominator. And then your change in the y values would be, you have to actually calculate the y value yourself if they're not given. So you substitute a into the function to get f of a, and you plug b into the function to get f of b. Well, we want to find out the change in the y values. That would be f of b minus f of a, the difference between the y values. Now, notice that the order is important. If you do f of b, subtract f of a, then the denominator has to be b minus a because that would be the y value and the x value at the right endpoint of this interval. And notice that f of a and a are the second term in both the numerator and denominator because that is the left endpoint for the interval when you want to calculate the average rate of change of the function. The average rate of change is the slope of the secant line for a function's graph starting at x equals a and ending at x equals b. So in other words, if you take the slope of the secant line, it's the slope of the line that passes through the points a comma f of a and b comma f of b. So let's say you have some graph of a function y equals f of x and you want to calculate the average rate of change which turns out to also be the slope of the secant line. Well you have one point where you have x equals a and the y value is f of a so a comma f of a is one point on the graph of the function and you also have x equals b and the y value is f of b so another point would be b comma f of b. If you take these two points and connect them with a straight line that's called the secant line between x equals a and x equals b. And so now you want to calculate the slope of that secant line. You use the standard slope formula. It's the change in the y values divided by the change in the x values. The change in the y values would be f of b subtract f of a, or the rise of the graph between x equals a and x equals b, and then divided by the change in the x values. The x values change from b, x equals b, to x equals a. So that distance would be b minus a. And so notice that the slope of the secant line is actually the same thing as average rate of change. You have f of b subtract f of a in the numerator for the change in the y values between these two different points on the line. And you have b minus a, which is the distance between the x values between the two points on the graph of the secant line. So example one, average rate of change. We're going to find the average rate of change or the slope of the secant line over an interval. For the function f of x equals the quantity x minus 3 all squared, whose graph is shown below, determine the average rate of change between the following pairs of input values. So number one, we're going to find the average rate of change or the slope of the secant line between x equals 1 and x equals 3 on the graph of this function. So the first thing to do is actually find out the y values for these two different x values because the x values are given but we also need the y values to calculate slope. So when you substitute an x equals 1 into the function, f of 1 will turn out to be 4. And when you substitute an x equals 3 into this function, you will have f of 3 is equal to 0. So now that you have the two points, one point is at 1 comma 4, and the other point is at 3 comma 0. If you connect those two points with a straight line, that's the secant line between those two points on the graph. And now we can actually find the slope of the secant line, or also average rate of change, of the function from x equals 1 to x equals 3. So average rate of change would be f of b minus f of a, so that would be f of 3 subtract f of 1, divided by b minus a, or 3 subtract 1 in this case. So f of 3 was 0, f of 1 was 4, so 0 subtract 4 in the numerator, and the denominator is 2, so negative 4 divided by 2 is negative 2. So the average rate of change for the function from x equals 1 to x equals 3 would be negative 2, which is also the slope of the secant line between 1 comma 4 and 3 comma 0. Number 2, let's find the average rate of change of the function from x equals 4 to x equals 7, so a different interval this time. So again, find out the y values for these two different x values. f of 4 would be, when you plug 4 into the function, the output value would be 1, so f of 4 is 1. And when you substitute in 7 for x value into the function, you'll have f of 7 is equal to 16. So you have two different points on the function now. You have 4 comma 1 is one point on the function's graph, and you also have 7 comma 16. So again, if you take these two points and connect them with a straight line, that's called a secant line between x equals 4 and x equals 7. And now we can find the slope of that secant line which is also average rate of change. So average rate of change is f of b minus f of a, which in this case would be f of 7 subtract f of 4, divided by b subtract a, or 7 subtract 4. And so the numerator is 16 subtract 1, the difference in the y values, and then the difference between the x values is 7 subtract 4, or 3, and then you have 15 divided by 3, or 5. So notice that the average rate of change in this case is 5, or the slope of the secant line in this case is 5, between x equals 4 and x equals 7. Notice that the slope of the secant line was a negative number between x equals 1 and x equals 3, 
and the slope of the secant line was positive between x equals 4 and x equals 7. So depending on what the x values are for your interval, you're trying to find the average rate of change or slope of the secant line, expect different values for the slope of the secant line or different values for the average rate of change because the interval has changed. Example 2. Now we're going to look at the average rate of a falling object. If an object is dropped from the top of a 220 foot tall building with an initial velocity of negative 22 feet per second, then the function that models the distance that the object has fallen is given by this function. d of t is equal to negative 16t squared, subtract 22t plus 220. Find the average speed of the object, the falling object, over the following time intervals. So we're going to find out the average rate of change, or the average speed of the object, between t equals 1 and t equals 5 seconds. So this is just like the previous example. We have the function that we can actually substitute in t equals 1 and t equals 5 into to find the output value. So let's do that first. So if you plug in t equals 1 into the function, you'll have d of 1 is equal to 182 feet. And if you do the same thing for the t equals 5, if you plug 5 into the function, d of 5 will be negative 290 feet. So now that you have the output values, you can actually find the average rate of change or the average speed of this falling object between 1 second and 5 seconds. The average speed will be d of 5 subtract d of 1, all divided by 5 subtract 1. It's the change in the distance divided by the change in the time. So d of 5 was negative 290, subtract d of 1, which was 182, so negative 290 to subtract 182 in the numerator. The denominator is 5 subtract 1. The numerator is negative 472 divided by 4. And so you'll come up with negative 472 divided by 4, which turns out to be negative 118. Now keep in mind that the units are important as well in this context. The numerator is in terms of feet that the object has fallen. The denominator is in terms of time, which is in seconds. So this would be negative 118 feet per second. That's the average rate of change between t equals 1 and t equals 5 seconds, or in this case would be the average speed of the falling object. So number two, this time we're going to find the average speed of the falling object between t equals a seconds and t equals a plus h seconds. So again, let's find out the output values first. So d of a, that would mean you plug a into the function for the values of t. So you have negative 16 times a squared instead of t squared, minus 22 times t, well that's 22 times a now because the input value is a, plus 220. If you simplify, you'll have negative 16 a squared, subtract 22 a plus 220. That's the output value whenever t is equal to a. And now find out the output value whenever t is equal to a plus h seconds. Do the same thing. Substitute in a plus h and for all the values of t. So you'll have negative 16 times a plus h quantity squared. Subtract 22 times a plus h in parentheses plus 220. And now simplify like we have in previous videos. You have negative 16 times a plus h times itself. Subtract 22 times the quantity a plus h plus 220. You'll need to take a plus h times a plus h and use the FOIL method to actually multiply that out before distributing the negative 16. Negative 22 can be distributed to the a plus h because there's no exponent on the a plus h. And then you also have plus 220 at the end. So after you FOIL, you'll have negative 16 on the outside. a times a will give you a squared, a times h, and another a times h will give you 2 times a h, plus h times h will give you h squared. And so negative 16 times the quantity a squared plus 2 a h plus h squared, subtract 22 distributed through the a plus h parentheses will give you negative 22 a, subtract 22 h, and then you have plus 220. So now we have one more step before we can actually find out this output value. Distribute the negative 16 through the first set of parentheses to get negative 16 a squared, subtract 32 a h, subtract 16 h squared, and then all the other terms just stay the same. Negative 22 a, subtract 22 h, plus 220. So that's the output value whenever the input value is t equals a plus h. So now keep in mind what we're trying to actually find. We want to find out the average speed of the falling object over this time interval. So we have average speed or average rate of change is the output value d of a plus h, subtract the output value d of a, divided by the change in the input values or the change in the t values. You have a plus h is the end value for the t, and then you also have t equals a as the starting value for the t values. So the numerator is d of a plus h subtract d of a, but notice in the denominator you have a subtract a, that's zero, and so the denominator is just h. Well, this expression we've seen before, this is called the difference quotient. You have d of a plus h minus d of a all over h. 
So if we want to find the average speed between t equals a and t equals a plus h, we have the two different output values that we've calculated. So we have d of a plus h, we calculated, and that's this expression, negative 16a squared, subtract 32ah, subtract 16h squared, subtract 22a, subtract 22h plus 220. And then we need to subtract the output value whenever t is equal to a. Well, we had to subtract this expression. So subtract negative 16a squared, subtract 22a, and also subtract 220. So whenever you do that, you'll have some terms cancel out. You have negative 16a squared, and then you have plus 16a squared. After the negative is distributed, you'll have negative 22a, and then again, you'll have plus 22a, that's zero. And then you'll have 220, and then subtract 220. That's also zero after you distribute the negative through the set of parentheses. So you have three different pairs of terms that cancel out or equal to zero. And so the only terms that are left over are negative 32ah, negative 16h squared, and subtract 22h in the numerator, and the denominator is still just h. Notice that all the terms in the numerator have an h in common, so you can factor out an h as the greatest common factor, or GCF, and so h is factored out. You have a negative 32a, subtract 16h, subtract 22 left over in the numerator, and the denominator is still h, and now if you're multiplying by h and also dividing by h, that's like multiplying or dividing by one, and so the average speed or average rate of change of this function over this time interval from t equals a to t equals a plus h is equal to negative 32a, subtract 16h, subtract 22. So as we have just talked about, the average rate of change is calculated in the previous example actually is known as a difference quotient because we have a difference in the numerator and also a quotient for the entire expression. In calculus, you're going to use difference quotients to understand the behavior of the average rates of change over smaller and smaller intervals. And this method is called a limit process and actually is used to calculate what is the instantaneous rate of change of the falling object at any instant in time, not over an interval, but at one instant. What's its speed? So one thing that we have found out so far when we calculate the average rate of change or slope of the secant line that we talked about in this video is that the slope of the secant line could be positive or negative. Well, that tells us information about the function over that interval. So let's say you have this graph and you want to calculate the average rate of change between x equals a and x equals b. So you have this graph at a, you have f of a is the output value, and at x equals b, you have the output value f of b. You connect those two points on the graph with a straight line, that's a secant line, and you calculate the slope of that line. If the slope of that secant line is a positive number, we know that the slope of the secant line is the same thing as average rate of change over that interval from x equals a to x equals b. And so the average rate of change would also be a positive number. If that's the case, notice that the graph is actually rising from left to right between x equals a and x equals b. And so that means the function's increasing on that interval where you actually calculate the average rate of change. On the other hand, if you calculate the average rate of change and the slope of the secant line is actually a negative number, or the average rate of change is a negative number, that means that the graph is falling from left to right over that interval. So at x equals a, you calculate the output value as f of a, and you calculate the output value when x equals b, and you notice that the graph is falling from left to right, that means that the function is decreasing on that interval because the slope of the secant line is a negative number, or the average rate of change is a negative number. So let's finish up this video with this last example. Example three, we're going to talk about calculating the average population change for a city. The table shows the population in thousands of Lansing, Michigan between the years 1970 and 2020. The variable x represents the number of years since 1970. So you have this table of values for the population of Lansing, Michigan. The table starts at 1970. Well, x is representing the years after 1970, so x equals 0 would represent the year 1970. We also have 1980, that would be x equals 10. 1990 would be 20 years after 1970, so x equals 20. 2000 would be x equals 30. 2010 would be x equals 40. And 2020 would be x equals 50. So in other words, the values in the x values are increasing by 10 because the years are increasing by 10 as well. And then the other column in the table, we have the population of Lansing, Michigan in thousands. So 131.403,000, 130.414,000 in 1980, 127.321,000 in 1990, 119.128,000 in 2000, 114.297,000 in the year 2010, and then finally 112.684,000 in 2020. We're going to find out what is the average rate of change in the population of Lansing between x equals 10 and x equals 20, and then also between x equals 40 and x equals 50 separately, and interpret what the value of the average rate of change means in practical terms related to the problem.
So again, x equals the number of years since 1970. So if we want to find the average rate of change between x equals 10 and x equals 20, we are using 10 years after 1970 and 20 years after 1970. So that would be 1980 and 1990. So average rate of change, or the change in the population, would be the change in the output values, or the change in the population values. So in 1990, it was 127.321 thousand people. Subtract 130.414 thousand people in 1980. That's the numerator. And the denominator is the change in the years. They would be 1990, subtract 1980, or in this case, it would be 20, subtract 10. And so the numerator is negative 3.093 thousand, and the denominator is 10 years, or that would be negative 0.3093 thousand people per year. What that means is that the population of Lansing is decreasing because the average rate of change was a negative number. So it's decreasing about 0.3092 thousand people per year between 1980 and 1990. On the other hand, if you want to calculate the average rate of change between x equals 40 and x equals 50, x equals 40 corresponds to the year 2010, and x equals 50 corresponds to 2020. If you want to calculate the average rate of change, we need the input values, but also the output values. So the population whenever x is equal to 50 would be the population in 2020, or 112.684 thousand people. Subtract the population whenever x is equal to 40, which would be the population in 2010, 114.297 thousand people, and then all divided by the change in the years, or the change in the input values, 50 subtract 40, or 2020 subtract 2010. So the numerator turns out to be negative 1.613 thousand, and the denominator is 10 years, so this would calculate to be negative 0.1613 thousand people per year. That means the population of Lansing is still decreasing, but not as much. So notice that the population is decreasing because the average rate of change is a negative number, but the average rate of change is not as large in terms of a negative number as it was between 1980 and 1990. So linear functions have a constant rate of change. As we're going to find out in the next video, a function of the form f of x is equal to m times x plus b, or y equals mx plus b, is a linear function, and the graph is a line with the slope the number m, and the y-intercept is the number b. On the other hand, if a function has a constant rate of change, it must be a linear function, as it will turn out in the next video. In general, the average rate of change of a linear function between any two points is a constant number m, the slope. This means that it doesn't matter which two endpoints you have on an interval, if you have a linear function, the average rate of change, or the slope of the secant line, will be the same for a linear function. So this is a good place to stop our video now that we talked about how to calculate the slope of the secant line and also how it relates to actually calculating the average rate of change of a function over an interval. If you have any questions about any examples in this video, please let me know. Or if you have any questions while you work on the homework for this section, please let me know that as well. And I'll see you at the next video when we talk about linear functions and models.